We've just come through the Passover, and though we primarily do it in remembrance of Christ, as he said, do this in remembrance of me, we also all read about how the Lamb's blood was splashed around the doors of the houses of Israel. One thing I thought about this year, though, is that by that one act of splashing the blood around the doors, they clearly made the symbol, uh, made the statement to the Egyptians, hey, you know what, we're no longer part of any of your gods. We are clearly marking our home as being a home of the God of Israel, the one true God of Jehovah. Very bold statement, so the uh, Egyptian guards and soldiers could walk down the street and identify, there's someone who's rejected our gods, there's someone who talks about Jehovah, or uh, not any of the gods of Egypt. That blood made it plain in everybody's eyes. He is my God. I am his son. We are his people. Hello, I'm Philip Shields, and welcome to Light on the Rock. Uh, the website, is this one here, is all about relationships. All about loving God with all of our heart and mind and soul and everything we have, and loving each other as ourselves, and getting more and more intimate with God, intimate with one another in a spiritual way. And Paul's overriding, arching, overarching claim to as claim to life, his goal was that I may know him. Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11. Maybe we should post that up here. That I may know him and the power of his, not just the resurrection, but his resurrection. I want him living in me. I want to know him. One who probably knew Yeshua better than any of us could imagine was saying my overriding goal in life is to better know him. Well, that's the message of this website. And this message today is to show how one simple change, one simple change, that you and I can start doing that will really start to affect our hearts, will really start to affect the way you feel about God in heaven, about Yeshua, about his promises, and you will begin to have a, a closer feeling of intimacy with him as never before. Here's an example I'm going to give you as my starting point. Sometime back there were wives and women. Well, first of all, we, can, we know there are wives and women out there. I could speak of a woman, I could speak of the woman, I could speak of that woman. Okay, you all know what I'm talking about, but I could also speak of my wife. Not just a woman, not just a wife, or the wife. Some of you call your wives the wife. I refer to Carol as my wife, and she refers to me as her husband. So I even had a conversation one time with uh, somebody at a church outing and, and two women came up to me, mother and daughter, and said, why do you always say my wife? Why don't you just say Carol? And I said, because she is my wife. Just like it says in Revelation 19, that his bride has made herself ready. And other many places where the Bible refers to the church as the bride of Christ, belonging to Christ. And we belong to him, as you'll see many times in this sermon. And um, I, I said, what about the one in Song of Solomon where he says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. So, and there's all kinds of verses that talk about your wife, our wife, his wife, and so on. So, do you always speak of God or about Yeshua, Jesus, or Jerusalem above, or the kingdom of God as yours? as yours. That might sound very simplistic, but I, I'll tell you, if you start to do this and start to understand it, something drastic, something major will happen in the way you think about things. Do you see yourself as belonging to God and Christ, and they belong to you? Not that we own God, not that we own Yeshua, but an identification with God and Yeshua. Is he your God? And are you his? Do you think of that all the time that way? Look in 2 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 6 to 18, 16 to 18. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. 
Here Paul says, I'll just read the first part quickly. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I, here we go, once you see it, I will be their God and they shall be, they, you and I, shall be my people. Verse 17, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what's unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons, my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You are God's daughter. You are God's son. I am God's son. I belong to Christ. I belong to God, my father. His son is my king. He is my savior, not just the savior. And when you talk about him amongst yourself, yourselves, I would really, really admonish you, encourage you to say, our Savior, my Savior. You know this already, but I think we all just talk about God, about Jesus, about the, about the Father. Most of us just say that. We don't say, we don't say uh, our Father. We don't say uh, our King, our Savior. So as a result of this message today, I hope from now on you'll take possession Take possession as belonging to God, belonging to Christ. Take possession of your high calling as being your calling and all who are associated with it. And make it yours just as clearly as the Israelites did when they splashed that blood around the doors of their homes. It's all over the Bible, this concept I'm talking about, by the way. Let's look at the lambs of Passover, how there's a progression. Turn to Exodus chapter 12, and we'll put the first one up here, Exodus 12, verse 3, and watch the progression. First of all, the Israelites were told to get out there, and you'll see these flocks of lambs. You'll, and so, let's, uh, 12, 3, Exodus 12, 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Okay, all these lambs out there, I'll pick one out. Okay, that's a lamb. According to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. A lamb, a lamb. Now, once you've looked over the lambs and have picked one, now you're going to take this one you picked back to your house. So Exodus 12, 4, and if the household's too small for the lamb, it's moved now, it's now in your hands. You have now moved from a lamb to the lamb. Let him, the neighbor next to his house, take it, and they're going to eat it together. According to the count for the lamb. Now let's move to verse 5. It gets more intimate now. Now you brought a lamb that is now the lamb, and you brought it home, closer to your home, living among, among your children. Your lamb. Not a lamb, not the lamb, your lamb. And remember, these all pictured Yeshua. These all pictured our Savior. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. Your lamb. Have you noticed that progression before? A lamb, the lamb, your lamb. And you know, it goes the same way when we talk about Yeshua as the lamb. Uh, John the Baptist said, behold, the, the lamb of God, God's lamb. So there's a possession there too, or an identification. The Lamb who takes away the sins of the world, the sin of the world, John 1, verse 29. But by the time we get to the Apostle Paul, the way he writes about it is in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, the last half of it. He says, he says, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ, indeed Messiah, Christ, means anointed, our Passover, not the Passover, not a Passover lamb, our Passover was sacrificed for us. Not just for the whole world, for us. Do you see the identification going on here? By the way, as a side note, I think it's a little touching and, and, and sad in a way. Uh, the, the Israelites would drink four cups of, or glasses of red wine during their Passover, during the Seder, and um, these reflected the four promises that God, that, that Jehovah gave to Israel in Exodus 6, uh, verses uh, 5 to 7. There, there, there are four promises that God gave here. I think that the cup that Yeshua said, drink of this, my cup, all of you, uh, of the new covenant, for the remission of sins. I think that's in Matthew 26, around verse 26, 27, I think. But anyway, he says in there, drink of my cup, this cup. 
I believe that was the third cup called the cup of redemption. Let's post on the board back here behind us the uh, Exodus 6 verses 5 to 7. We'll, you'll see the four promises that God gave Israel. And you'll understand better why Yeshua said, I, couldn't, I can't drink of the cup again until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Exodus 6, verses 5 to 7, I've also heard the groaning, uh, quoting God now, of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians kept in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Not just the covenant, my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah. Now here go the, we're now going to read the four promises of God. And these were represented by the four glasses of wine that they would drink, that the adults would drink. I will bring you out. Okay, the first is the cup of bring you out uh, from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The second cup was I will deliver you. I will rescue you from their bondage. The third cup was I will redeem you. I will purchase you. I will pay back. I will buy you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So the cup of redemption was the third one. The fourth one, verse 7. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You'll be my people, and I will be your God. That never happened in the time of Christ. In fact, they killed him. They killed the Son of God, who would have been their God. They killed him. We all killed him by our sins. The Romans killed him. You and I killed him. We all did. But my point is, after he had had them drink of the cup of redemption, because that cup of his blood of the new covenant was for the remission of sins, for redemption. He couldn't drink the fourth cup because it wasn't going to be fulfilled that night. And so he says, I won't drink of the cup anymore until I fulfill it anew and drink of it anew in my father's kingdom. So how sad in a way, but that's why he didn't drink any more of the wine. But when we speak of Christ as the Savior, watch the similar progression about Savior. In Luke 2, verse 11, Luke 2, verse 11, the shepherds were out there at night, and when the Savior was born and revealed to the shepherds at night, notice the progression here. Luke 2, 11, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior. Then we go to John 4. In this, in this example, uh, Yeshua has talked to the Samaritan woman who's convinced that he is the Messiah. She goes into town, leaves her bucket there at the well of the Samar of Samarian well, Samaritan well, and goes into town. And the men came out and they said to the woman after talking with Yeshua, and we'll put it up, John 4, 42. Now we believe, they said to her, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. The shepherds were told that there was a Savior born out there. This woman and the people of Samaria understood that he was the Messiah. But it gets even more personal. The mother of Yeshua, Mary, Miriam in her Hebrew name, Mary, the mother of Yeshua, realized what was happening when she realized what was happening to her in her humility. She proclaims in this praise, in this prayer of praise in Luke 1, verses 46 and 47. She says, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Here she's speaking about God the Father as her Savior because, frankly, both of them, God the Father and Yeshua, are, are our Saviors. They, they definitely are. I mean, God saved us by sending Yeshua to die for us instead of making all of us die. He took all of our sins and put it on his guiltless Son because he loved all of us so much. Don't ever worry about how much God loves the world, how much God loves you. He made his own perfect son die for you and for me. But anyway, she said, my soul, uh, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Now, there are dozens of scriptures that talk about Yeshua being our Savior. But here's an example where God also, also is Savior. I will tell you something. 
There's no doubt in my mind that God the Father was just as crucified on that cross as his son was. I can't imagine my wife being crucified or my son or my daughter, either one of my daughters. I, I can't imagine that I wouldn't, in a heartbeat, be up there for them instead. Let them be free. Father was crucified as well, I'll tell you. He was. In, in his heart, he was. It was his son who was the Savior who was crucified. Do you regularly speak of my Savior like Mary did? My Savior. Or do you always just say Christ? Or Messiah? Or Jesus? Or Yeshua? Try what I'm saying, was what I'm trying to say. My message today is to get you to start saying, My Savior. Even when you pray, and you say, Father in heaven, my Abba, my Father, I thank you so much that you've given me my Savior. Something will happen in your heart. I know it will. It's happened in mine. I've done this for many years now. In fact, I gave a sermon like this, I think, eight or nine years ago. Moses and David certainly practiced this. Uh, they didn't just say God. They said, my God, our God. Okay. Right after the Red Sea crossing, Moses led the Israelites in this song in Exodus 15, verse 1 and 2. I'll read it to you here. And Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to Jehovah and spoke, saying, I will sing to Jehovah, the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Now look at verse 2, how personal Moses made it and how personal he made the Israelites sing it. Jehovah is my strength, my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. In the Hebrew, that's, by the way, my Yeshua. I'll come back to that in a minute. He is my God. I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. He is my God. He is my strength. He is my song. He is my salvation. Are you getting what I'm saying? Do you ever speak of my God? Except as a profanity, today they say, oh my God, all the time, as a profanity, instead of in worship and in praise and prayer, just say, oh my God, in heaven I come before you. You are my God. It's perfectly all right to say it. Hundreds of examples in the Bible of that. Or do you tell of God's majesty as your salvation? The phrase, my salvation, in Exodus 15, 2, in the Hebrew, is my Yeshua, by the way. My Yeshua, pointing to Yeshua, who is our salvation. Yeshua, that's how you pronounce it. With the second syllable, <laughs> emphasize the second syllable, my Yeshua. Uh, David does the same thing. He had just in 2 Samuel 22, verses 1 to 3, David spoke to Jehovah the words of this song on the day when Jehovah delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, now notice now in verse 2, we're in 2 Samuel 22, and now verse 2. Jehovah is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. He's not just saying Jehovah is the rock or a rock. He's not just saying a fortress. No, he's my fortress. He's my rock, the God of my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. Are you feeling it? Do you ever in prayer or talking about Yeshua, talking about God the Father, ever in conversation, instead of just saying Jesus or Yeshua or God or even the Father, ever talk about our Father or our Savior or my Savior? That's what David did. That's what Moses did. That's what Paul did. That's what Daniel, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah. That's what all of them did. That's what Ezekiel did. When you pray to your Savior, do you just say, My Savior and my God, my salvation? If not, why not? I'll read to you Psalm 18. This is out of the Holman translation. I could use the NIV, the uh, complete Jewish Bible. Uh, it says, and I, I say that because in the beginning words here, um, the New King James and King James put the word will. I will love you, O Lord. And the other newer translations say, I love you, Jehovah. Have you ever said that? 
Have you ever said, Oh, Father, Holy Father, my Father, my Abba, I sure love you. If you've never said that, say it. Think about it. Feel it. Say it. I love you, Jehovah, my strength. Jehovah is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my mountain where I seek refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Do you and I speak like that? I say we don't. I ask you, why not? He is yours, and you are his. Speak as if you know that. Speak as if you believe that. Something will happen in your heart. When Yeshua taught his disciples to pray, he didn't just say, oh, dear God, or God in heaven. He said, our Father, our Abba, our Daddy, our Father. Our... When you pray, do you sometimes use those words, my Father. I come to you, my Father. I come to you, great God, my Father. Or do you cry out to Yeshua, to Jesus, and say, Yeshua, my beloved friend, my beloved Savior, my King, my Prince of Peace, my friend, my God, please hear my prayer to you. And yes, you can pray to Yeshua. John did. Come, dear Lord. Very last verses of the book of Revelation, Stephen's last words. You know, into your hands I commend my spirit. Don't charge them uh, with the sin, my Lord, or, or, or Jesus, I think he said. And so, and, and so it's, it, it, yeah, it's perfectly all right to pray to Yeshua as well. And so Thomas, one of the disciples who was not present when Yeshua showed himself after the resurrection, uh, said this when Yeshua, uh, first of all, he appeared to the other disciples and he said, I'm not going to believe in him. Uh, John 20, verses 24, 25. I'm not going to believe that he, he, come on, until I see in his hands the print of the nails, that big old hole they put in his hands, until I see that big old hole in his side, and I thrust my arm in there, I'm not going to believe he's been resurrected. Come on. I saw that dead man. There's no way he's walking around today. That's basically what Thomas said. Now let's look at John 20, verses 26 to 28. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. His disciples, his disciples. You, you see the ownership. Yeshua is talking about his disciples. And Thomas with them, Yeshua came, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Shalom. Imagine that. You're all there and some boom, someone's right there in front of you. Doors are locked. The walls are secure. Shalom. Peace unto you. And uh, then he said to Thomas, Hey, Thomas. You, come over here. Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Look at them. Reach your hand in here in my side. Go ahead. Stick it all the way in. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. Notice the identification that Thomas uses as he answers, probably bowing down at this point. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God, my Lord, my God. You talk about your Lord, your God, to one another in prayer as you write about him, as you speak of him. Do you know there are 150 scriptures that don't just talk about God, but my God. There are 215 other scriptures that speak of our God. You put those together, what do we have? We have 365 scriptures that say either my God or our God. You add dozens more where you have your God. These are very specific, a belonging to. Let's start to use it. Let's start to use it. Let's turn now to Galatians 2.20. John the Baptist spoke of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And fair enough, God's Son did take care of the sins of all people of all time. But let's personalize it, like Paul did. Like Paul did. Um, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, He died for me. For me. Let's put it up here. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. In the life I live by, in the flesh, I live by faith 
in the Son of God or of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. I'm not emphasizing anything else in that verse except this part. The way I see it, Paul said, is that of everyone in the world that he died for, he, I see it, it was just as good like he died just for me. Just for me. For me. So when you pray, Our Father in heaven, I come to our Savior, Yeshua, my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Have you ever prayed that prayer? For me. Paul did. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, Exodus 13, 8, God told the Israelites that when the time comes and the Israelites are, your children are asking you about this Exodus, Exodus 13, 8, you shall tell your son in that day, this is done because of what Jehovah did for me when I came up from Egypt. Not just what Israel, what Jehovah did for Israel, not just what Jehovah did for all of us, not just what Jehovah did for our country or our tribe. No, what Jehovah, Jehovah did for me when I came up from Egypt. Make it real. Make it personal. So what am I saying? Personalize your, your relationship. Make it yours. You know, when someone starts a new job at a new company, let's say it's my son or daughter or whatever, and let's say when they're growing up, they're 18 or 19, and they're a lot, a lot older than that now. But let's say they come back home and they start talking about what it's like first day at work. They talk about they do this and they do that. I remember one of my kids one time doing that, and I said, well, when I start hearing you saying we do this and we do that, then I'll know you're really assimilated into the company. As long as it's they, you're still looking as an outsider. But anyway, so come out of the Christian closet, openly identify with your God, like the Israelites did, splashing blood all around the door, top and sides. And uh, they were making a proclamation. We are no longer a part of the gods of Egypt. We're, God, we're, we're part of the God of Israel. We have to openly show the world who, to whom we belong. I know back in Iraq, the ISIS people were going around spray painting in black paint on people's doors and walls outside of the big letter N in Arabic, standing for Nazarene. This is a Christian who believes in that Nazarene. Basically, they were marking homes that are free for the taking. You're free for persecution. You can throw rocks through their window. You can kill them. You can, whatever you want to do, you can take their daughters. Because these are Nazarenes. Would you have gladly proclaimed that you are a Nazarene? That you belong to Yeshua? I'm not saying God is your little genie that you own like a, in, a, in a bottle. I'm not saying that. But he is yours. And you are his. Look at John 20, verses 11 to 13. Mary Magdalene had gone earlier to the garden tomb and it was, the stone had already been rolled open. The body was already gone. Well, she comes back in John 20, verse 11. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the foot where the body of Jesus had lain. So the tomb in the garden, at least the one I went into, did seem to have a did seem to have a, uh, a raised area where you'd put a body. I really felt personally that it was the correct tomb. But anyway, um, she saw two angels there sitting. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord. My Lord. They've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they've laid. My Lord. My Lord. Do you ever say, my Lord, my master, my husband, my boss, my savior? Yeshua then starts to talk to her, and he, she thinks he's the gardener. Uh, but he goes on to identify himself and let her recognize him. And uh, notice what he says to her in John 20, verse 17. She, gave, she tried to give him a hug. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. I know King James says, don't touch me, but apparently there was a, a touch. There was a cling going on, but don't, you can't keep clinging to me is what he's saying. I've got to go, for I have not yet ascended to my father. He was the wave sheaf. Now, wave sheaf day is not resurrection day. It's the day after resurrection day. He was resurrected at the end of the Sabbath, three days and three nights. At the end of Saturday night, Saturday late afternoon, before sundown. 
and sundown on is, is wave sheath day. The tomb's already empty by Sunday morning. So he says, I have yet to accept, uh, ascend to my father. Why didn't he just go? Because he was going to do it when the high priest raised the omer, the wave sheaf, or the flower of fine barley flour. And that would be the symbol that he, the timing that he would go, the signal that he would go. But he says, John 20, 17, look how intimate this is. Look how intimate this is. Go to my brethren. Go to my brothers. He may have meant his real physical brothers, James, Joseph, and others. Um, but I think he's also referring to the disciples. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. It's our Father now, our Father in heaven, whose name is hallowed and holy. My Father in heaven and your Father, and to my God. Yes, Yeshua has a God. It's God the Father. And to your God. In verse 18, she goes and tells the disciples whom, whom she'd seen. Yeshua is doing several things here. He's calling his disciples my brothers. He may have been referring to his flesh and blood brothers as well. We are also his brothers. Do you speak of the brethren or the members of the church, however you recall them or talk about them? Or do you talk about our brethren? Our brethren. We are brothers. We are sisters. And you know what? Hebrews 2, in Hebrews 2, Yeshua says he's not ashamed of you and me. I think that's phenomenal. He's not ashamed of me after everything I've done, after everything you've done. Hebrews 2, verse 11 and 12. For both he who sanctifies, it's God the Father, and those who are being sanctified are all one. And Christ is doing this for us too. And for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, brethren, brothers, sisters, saying, I will declare your name. This is Yeshua saying it to God the Father, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. I'll post later on. That's not the verse that says he's not ashamed. To, yeah, it's right there in verse 11. He is not ashamed of me. He's not ashamed of you. He calls you his brother. He calls you his sister. And he will defend you. Yes, he died for you while you were yet sinner. And when you sin, he will stand up for you. And he will tell the accuser to get out. I paid the price for my brother. Get out of here. I'll say again, my children are my children. I'm also their father. They are mine and I am theirs. It's the same with Yehovah. You know this, I know you know this, but I'm hearing people, I'm not hearing people so much say, my God, our God, my Father. They just say God, or God the Father, or the Father. Yeshua's own example, he's, he often said the Father, he, he did. But over 50 times, 5-0, over 50 times, just the Savior refers, our Savior refers to Yehovah Most High as my Father. Over 50 times. You do your own concordance search on that and see. Yeshua also called Yehovah Most High Abba. Abba. The first words that would come out of a new, a new Jewish boy's mouth today is Abba. Abba. Daddy. Abba. It's even easier to say than Daddy. But it means Daddy. A dear father. You know, when he was in the garden, Abba, is there any way that this cup can pass from me? He used Abba there. The king of the universe is my Abba. The king of the universe is your Abba, your daddy. We need to turn our hearts to him and give him our hearts as we realize this and let it sink in. Romans 8, 15, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Daddy, Abba, Father. 
Galatians 4, verses 6 to 7. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. The Holy Spirit comes from God the Father. There are other verses that say it comes through the Son. So it's also the Spirit of His Son. But it originates from God the Father. God has sent the forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So the King of the universe is also, the King of the universe is also my Abba and your Abba. Now back for a moment to the phrase, my God. Just realize there are 150 times it is used. 150 times. Moses often spoke of my God. Joshua did. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put these in the notes just to save a little time. But I'll put these in the notes. So if you want to study them and look at them, those of you who want to do that, they'll be there. I'll just mention a couple here real quickly. Um, Ruth, in speaking to Naomi, your God shall be my God, your people, my people, your God shall be my God. Solomon in, in prayer, oh, Jehovah, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father today, but I'm just a little child. I don't know how to go in or come out or come out and go in. Uh, my God, Elijah in resurrecting the widow's son three times said, Jehovah, my Elohim, Jehovah, my God, Isaiah. Oh, Jehovah, you are my God. Isaiah 25, 1. Daniel did. My God sent his angels, so these lions haven't eaten me. Hosea, Joel, Jonah, Micah, they all did. Paul talked of my God many, many, many times. Romans 1, verse 8. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 3. Philippians 1, 3. We would say, what I'm trying to get across, folks, is that you and I would say, most of us would say, I thank God. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Or I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Paul doesn't. Paul says, I thank my God. My God. 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I thank my God always concerning you. And on and on and on. So many places. David has it all the way through. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit here. How about the kingdom of God? Do you ever call the kingdom of God your kingdom? I'll bet most of you haven't. You're praying that your kingdom come, that includes you? Okay, Yeshua taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed and sacred is your name. May your kingdom come. May your kingdom come. So it is the kingdom of God. And we know that. Did you know it's also called the kingdom of Jesus Christ? In Ephesians 5, 5, Ephesians 5, 5, For you know this, that no fornicator, unclean person, people who are still practicing these things, I don't mean if you've ever been a fornicator, but if you were still practicing these, nor covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. In the kingdom of Christ and God. Certainly we know that uh, in Luke 19, verse 12, Yeshua also, well, first of all, yeah, Yeshua had parables. Luke 19, 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country, country to receive for himself, for himself, the nobleman is Christ, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he went back to heaven. He's going to receive that kingdom and will return. So whose kingdom is it now? It's still the kingdom of God now shared with Yeshua. So you can honestly, correctly, biblically say the kingdom of God and Christ. But are you consciously realizing by now the kingdom of God is also your kingdom? Your kingdom. Do you realize that? Do you talk that way? You may not be hearing that preached much, but it's all through the scriptures. In Daniel, I think it's 7, uh, in the 20s, around verses 21 to 24. I don't have it in my notes. I'll have to put it in there. I think then the Son of Man came in the clouds and came to the Ancient of Days, and to him was bestowed a kingdom, and it, and it was given to the saints, to the saints. But here in Luke 22, verses 28 to 29, 
You are those, Luke 22, verses 28 to 29, you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom. I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me. So what do you think of them apples? <laughs> Luke 12, 32. Luke 12, 32 now. Do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Okay, it's prepared for us, but Luke 12, 32 said, I bestow, I want to give you the kingdom. And Luke 22 says, I'll bestow upon you a kingdom. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, which cannot be shaken, it goes on from there. Since we're receiving a kingdom, it's going to be yours. The kingdom of God is also the kingdom of Philip Shields. And whatever your name is, it's your kingdom too. Yes, I say that on authority of God's word. It's my kingdom too. You see, I don't own the USA, but you know what? It is my country as much as it's yours, if you live here, or wherever the country you live in. I am American, so in the same way it's God's kingdom, I'm a citizen of it, and so in the same way it's also my kingdom and your kingdom. I think even more so than America is my country. Let that, let that really sink in. So when you speak of one, once in a while of one another, and you talk about going to the Feast of Tabernacles, and the coming of Yeshua, and the setting up of the reign of the Messiah, the kingdom of God, I'll have to give a sermon on that soon, actually it's not just a millennial reign. The kingdom of God is, is up there in heaven. And it's always been there. It's not just coming. It's there. It's always been there. And so keep that in mind. So as we speak to one another, uh, let, let's excitedly talk about it. Can't wait for our, our kingdom to come. Our kingdom. Not just the kingdom or God's kingdom. We're co-inheritors, remember, with Christ. Romans 8 says that that we are co-inheritors. Romans 8, I forget the verse now, something like, I don't know, verse 17, 18, somewhere in there. Of course, it's our kingdom as well. Now, what about Jerusalem above? Is this getting too bold? <laughs> Do you realize that the Jerusalem above is a city of God? Yes, I know that. We all know it's called the city of God. Do you know it's also your city? Have you ever thought of that? Do you ever speak of that? Right now, the kingdom of God is headquartered in the heavenly Jerusalem. We think of it as the city of God, but scripture actually says and shows that the whole city is called the bride. Why is it called the bride? Because that's where the bride and the son, the, the groom, the son of God will live. Yeshua went to prepare a place for us. Go back and listen to my sermon uh, titled, I Go Prepare a Place for You. Just put that in the search bar, prepare a place. Prepare a place and it will pop up. recommend you hear that. It'll be a good pre-Pentecost sermon. Uh, where will the wedding take place? And all of that. You know, I go prepare a place for you. It, it talks very much about how that's my city. That's your city. We'll reign on the earth with our, with our husband Yeshua. Yes, of course, we'll reign right here on earth. But our home, where we live, where we're from, what we're part of, is heavenly Jerusalem. I really believe that though we're ruling and reigning here on earth with Christ for a thousand years, we will often zip back and forth up to heavenly Jerusalem, spend a little time with our Abba. At the speed of thought, we'll be able to get there and back. The new earth will have many cities in it, but the city of God coming down out of heaven will be my city and yours. Hebrews 11 Verses 8 to 10. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a different place. Verse 9, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, living in tents. Verse 10, for he waited for the city who has, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He waited for that city. 
Hebrews 11, continuing verses 13 to 16, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but they embraced them as pilgrims, it goes on to say. Uh, they plainly say, seek that they, that they seek, verse 14, a homeland. Now let's go to verse 16. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. That's the country they really want to be a part of. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. I just love that verse. God is not ashamed to be called my God. Oh, I might have some people who are ashamed to be called my friend or whatever. If they, I don't know, if they don't like me or something or hear something they don't like. God's not ashamed of me. For he has prepared a city for them. There it is. He has prepared a city for them. Hebrews 13, 14. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We seek the one to come. Do we think of heavenly Jerusalem as our city? I sure hope you do. So let's wrap it up. Do you remember what God said? What Paul said, quoting God, in 2 Corinthians uh, 6, verses 16 to 18. I will be their God I'll have it bold-faced, underlined, italicized up there. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, Therefore come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what's unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters. You shall be my sons and daughters. Wow. 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 So the fourth cup. I shall be, you shall be my people, and I shall be your God. That's the fourth cup of Passover. Isn't that awesome? Is Jehovah your God? Do people know Jehovah as your God? Do they know you as his people? Do you call him your God? My God, my Savior, my King, my brother? You talk about that that way, my creator, my Yehovah, my Elohim, my master, my redeemer, my redeemer, my maker, my God whom I worship. So if someone asks you to pray for them, start using these kinds of terms is what I'm saying. Yes, I'll be glad to go to my God and pray for you. And my healer, my God will answer that prayer, I pray. You see, you talk about my God, my healer, my Savior. I am his, and he is mine. I am my father's son and my Savior's brother. So start using my and our, and you'll start seeing some big, big things happening. I'd love to hear that that's happening for you. Let's end in uh, first Song of Songs, in, in Song of Songs 6, verse 3. Song of Songs, verse, chapter 6, verse 3. I love the way it's stated here. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. In a nutshell, isn't that really what the whole message today is about? In a nutshell, isn't that what the plan of salvation is about? That we're brought back to God, we're reconciled to Him. Be watching for my sermon on how important it is to be reconciled with one another. So build that kind of closeness, speak of that closeness, that kind of intimacy, that kind of identification with your maker and your Abba, your daddy. Let's close. Our Father in heaven, our Father, our Abba. Wow. I don't think we understand it, Father. I don't think I understand how, what a high calling you've given us. What an incredibly high calling you've given us. We raise our hands in praise to you like a little child reaching up for her daddy or his daddy. We reach out to you, Father, our Father. We reach out to our Savior, to our Yeshua. We long for the time you will come and we'll be part, really, in every way of your kingdom. And we want to receive your kingdom. And we want to be part of everything that you Help us to hate the ways of Satan, the ways of this world. We're in it. We have to love the people. We, we do. We will. 
Help us to come out of Egypt. Help us to come out of this world. Help us to come out of Babylon. Help us to be part of you. And in you, there's nothing but holiness. Holy Father, our Father, impart your holiness and covering upon us as we leave now and smile upon us. In this day of coronavirus, the Wuhan virus, we just pray that you will, in Yeshua's mighty name, just knock that virus out now. Wake us up to come to you. Watch over your children in this time. Let us not be fearful, but have faith. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.